Well, <clears throat> the admittedly very long scripture reading for today, uh, which Gay read perfectly, perfectly. Mike uh, just said a minute ago that um, we're all better preachers when Gay Fuller reads the scripture for us, and it's true. Um, <clears throat> so thank you for that. This text, this long text, this beautiful narrative begins with the words, on that same day. On that same day. The same day they are talking about is the one that we know as the third day. The same day that the women went to the tomb, the same day that those same women found the stone rolled away that had once closed Jesus' tomb just three days before, the same day that those curious women went boldly into the tomb to find that Jesus' body really wasn't there, the same day they learned that he had been raised, the same day that those women excitedly returned and reported the great news of his resurrection to the apostles, the same day that those devastated apostles thought this report was nonsense, the same day that Peter ran to the tomb wanting to understand what they might be talking about, and the same day that Peter saw the very same thing for himself. On that same day, on that same first Easter day, we meet two disciples. One named Cleopas and another whose name we don't know, but who was likely among the extended group of Jesus' followers. They have left Jerusalem at this point and are traveling together to Emmaus. A seven-mile journey, it tells us, and they are likely returning home after having traveled to Jerusalem for Passover, maybe already thinking about what they're going to do with their lives now that the whole Jesus experiment is over. They were talking to each other, discussing everything that had just happened over the last few days, including the reports of those women and Peter. We don't know much of anything about this conversation they were having on that road, but we have imaginations and we have empathy. So, knowing nothing of their relationship with each other, I have to imagine that they were sharing grief and reviewing details of these days. Frustrated, sad, disappointed and lost, lonely, afraid and angry, maybe ashamed, heartbroken and filled with doubt, they had bet their lives on the wrong savior. Two days ago, the one that they had been following had been brutally beaten and murdered publicly. Horrific sounds and images are lodged in their brains. While not much is said about this conversation, one biblical commentator speaks of the probable intensity between these two. It seems that the narrator uses three different Greek terms to describe the conversation in those first two verses. And I am not going to teach you Greek today. I just want to teach you about the meanings of those three words. In those first two verses, three different words used to describe this conversation. One, that implies an intense discussion. One, meaning emotional dialogue and one that meant debate or examining evidence together. So why does that even matter, preacher? Because their conversation may have just been a little bit hotter than we assume when we first read it. Their discussion, their emotional dialogue, their debate may have resembled the conversations that we have found ourselves in recently. You know the ones, the ones that happen in person, the ones we boldly enter into on social media, and even the ones that we play out in our minds. Had they lost sight of each other as we have? Had their frustration and sadness and disappointment spiraled down into an argument? Out of their own deep pain, had the tension within these two boiled over into terseness between them? 
had two men literally traveling on the same road to the same hometown, sharing a common suffering, found a way to combat with one another. We can imagine that it is possible because we've been there, we might even be there right now. I recently read, and I'm currently rereading a book that if you've talked to me really at all recently, I've probably told you about. Um, it's a book by the Arbinger Institute called The Anatomy of Peace, and the subtitle is Resolving the Heart of Conflict. And it draws uh, almost painful attention to a reality that we all know inherently. And this is it. Each of us in any moment, is operating from one of two ways of being toward others. We are operating with a heart of peace, that's one, and with a heart of peace, we see others as people. We see others as people with hopes and needs and cares and fears that are as real to me as my own. That's a heart at peace. Or, alternatively, we are toward each other with a heart at war. With a heart at war, I'm seeing other people as objects, meaning that when I see someone, I view him or her as an obstacle to be dealt with. I see him or her as a vehicle to get what I want, or maybe even an altogether irrelevancy. That brief description of a heart at war is all that we need to recognize that we are currently operating with one toward people in our own lives. Our heart is at war when we decide that someone is on the other side of an issue from us. We take a side and we stand firmly on it. We nobly join a camp. We finally find our tribe. We hunker down with those with whom we are of one mind. And from our side, from our camp, from our tribe, from our gathering of the like-minded, we look at those on the other side, in the other camp, in an altogether different tribe and of another mind, and we make decisions about who they are all together. And with our assumptions in tow, we embark on conversation with an Emmaus tone. We have intense discussions over rapidly performed executions in Arkansas, about gun control and about Second Amendment rights. We have emotional dialogue, deeply emotional dialogue about climate change, about sexism, about health care, and about immigration. We debate black lives. We debate police. We debate people's very lives. We find our own denomination again in the national spotlight over our long and gut-wrenching debate about the inclusion of LGBTQ Christians in our churches. We dive so deeply into these conversations that we stop seeing what we have named the other side as people. Those who disagree with us have become objects. They are obstacles to overcome. They are vehicles to get what we want, and they are irrelevancies to ignore. And this isn't limited to nameless strangers we encounter on our, string, on our screens. We do this within our families. We do this to our friends. We do this to neighbors and to members of our church. But we don't do it because any of us are bad people. That's not why. That's not what this is about. We do it because, like the dejected disciples on the road to Emmaus, we're frustrated. We're sad, we're disappointed, and we're lost, and we're lonely, and we're afraid, and we're angry, and we're ashamed, and we're heartbroken, and we are filled with doubt. We might even feel like we have bet our lives on something that has let us down. Our broken hearts, our broken hearts are the ones that go to war. Our broken hearts are the ones that need to meet Jesus today at this table. Just as it changed everything for Cleopas and the other, it can open our eyes to truth. They insist that this stranger stay with them, and so he does. He sits down at their table, the risen Christ, and then the crucified Savior, the risen Jesus, the guest of the disciples, becomes the host. When he took the bread, he blessed it. 
He broke it and he gave it to them and it is then that their eyes were opened wide. Their minds exploded with connections. Their hearts burst open in gratitude and deep relief. They recognized him. They saw him as the risen Lord and they saw the same one who had fed 5,000 with, with five loaves and a couple of fish. They saw the same one who had shared the final Passover meal with his closest friends. They saw the truth in the testimony of those women at the empty tomb. In the breaking of the bread, a disappointing and confusing day suddenly became Easter. It became Easter in their bones. It became Resurrection Day in their souls. Now they realize that their heated idea debate on the road to Emmaus had been interrupted by the Word made flesh, by the Savior of the world, by the Messiah, by Emmanuel, God with us, by Jesus Christ, risen indeed, the encounter with Jesus Christ over the holy meal turned these grieving hearts at war into bursting hearts at peace. They got up from the table and they charged back to Jerusalem. Only everything about the road was different this time. The road back to Jerusalem was walked with urgency to share the news that the Lord really has risen, not regret about their wasted time on an empty promise. It was walked with joy this time, not despair. It was walked with confidence, not doubt. It was walked with a skip in their step and not dragging feet. It was walked with a story to tell together, not a story to debate again. It was walked in peace, not war. They had approached Emmaus in emotional discussion. They had approached in heated debate, in humiliation over having hitched their wagon to a loser. With anger toward the state, with disappointment in their friends, with a need of someone to blame, with confusion, with hatred, with the desperate need to have been right, and on and on and on, you know many of the things that we are likely to approach this table with today. But at the table, their eyes were open. They saw the Lord really is risen. They saw it. They shared something sacred and they found joy in their companion and their hearts were tuned back to peace. And as they left the table, their faith was given new life and their relationship was grounded in new depth forgiveness, hope, grace, and peace. The sacrament that we are about to share today is the grounding ritual of our faith. Repeated practice brings renewed depth to our faith, reminding us of who God is and what God truly has done. It reminds us that we are forgiven again and again and again and again. It fills us with hope, reminding us that Jesus, who defeated death, meets us at this table. It reminds us that God's grace is for us in spite of our nature. It reorients our hearts to peace and hospitality toward others, especially with, the, with those whom we feast and even those with whom we disagree. This table, like the one to Emmaus, moves us from isolation of our need to be right into community with people that our hearts at war might just prefer if they would dine elsewhere. This table changes the tone of our language toward one another. This table eases the anxiety that overwhelms us. This table makes it far more difficult to separate ourselves from those who make us uncomfortable. But we will still try. We'll still try to separate because we're human our hearts will go to war, we'll get mad and we'll judge, we'll mock and we'll argue and we will say things that we regret and we will think things that bring us shame. We have and we are and we will, which is why we have to keep coming back. We have to keep coming back to a table that doesn't really see sides. You will not approach this table today with your side, with your camp, with your tribe, 
with only those with whom you agree on the, matter, on the matters that matter most to you. You will approach it with children of God, with siblings in Christ, with beautiful and broken people just like you and just like me. You will receive the same sustenance and the same mission to love as someone who makes you crazy. You will receive the same commission to be God's person in the world as someone who you think or maybe even know is flat wrong. Because that is the invitation before us. That's it. To approach this table again and again and again, we will forget that the Lord really has risen. We will forget that we are loved. We will forget that Christ longs to meet us here. And we will certainly forget that every child of God shares that same invitation. While we encounter the presence of the Lord who really has risen at this table today, we will leave here and before we know it, our hearts will go to war again. And we will find ourselves back on the road to Emmaus. Which is why John Wesley, the founder of our faith, implored us in his sermon on the duty of constant communion. He said, I am to show you that it is the duty of every Christian to receive the Lord's Supper as often as he or she can. If we have any regard for the plain command of Christ, if we desire the pardon of our sins, if we wish for strength to believe, to love and obey God, then we should neglect no opportunity of receiving the Lord's Supper. Then we must never turn our backs on the feast which our Lord has prepared for us. The Lord who really has risen has prepared the table for you, where the longing of your spirit will be met and you will find your heart at peace. The Lord who really has risen will be host at this table that can transform your walk to Emmaus into a joyful return trip to Jerusalem. The Lord who really has risen will open your eyes to see the people feasting with you are more than the opposing viewpoint that they hold. The Lord really has risen. Come and meet him here. And whatever you do, don't miss a chance to come back. Amen.